Uh, today it's my pleasure, uh, I'll, I'll let Andrew introduce this particular panel, but Andrew James Patterson, uh, an eminent Toronto uh, artist and personality, um, also has been featured in at least two 7 a uh festivals, which I think he may have the distinction of being one of maybe two or three artists who've had that distinction of actually being in more than one festival that we've done. Um, or <laughs> last year. And was also our blog writer last year. So two years ago. Or two years ago. Well, mm -hmm. last festival. Last yeah. festival. So uh, welcome. Thank you for coming back. And uh, I give the mic over to Andrew. <coughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks for everything you're doing. Um, moving on now. Um, the, the far left, because she's a far left person, I believe. <laughs> we have. Irma Optimist, who flew in last night with spectacular results, or almost no results, and is very happy to actually be here. And, be, and then sitting on her right, not that she's anything right about it, we have Teresa Dillon, and we have Agnes Nevegaard sitting on my left, because she's well left with me. <laughs> and um, that's who we have. I, if my understanding is correct, Agnes is performing tonight. And Irma's performing Friday, and Teresa's performing on Saturday. And I guess we'll start off by just having you talk a little bit about yourself. It's a fairly conventional way to start, but it creates space and opens the air. Irma, I'd like to ask you a little bit about some of your background, how you came to be where you are today, and also talk specifically about LAVA, which I understand is a forum you're involved in for living art and experimental culture. I start. Okay. Yeah. Yes, um, <coughs> yesterday I tried to come uh, from Helsinki, so I am Finnish, living in Finland, in Helsinki. I go in through Amsterdam to Toronto, but because of some technical problems, I came via Scandinavian women, Agnes and me, and so I came through Iceland. And it is the quickest way to come from Helsinki to Toronto. You can calculate, yes. <laughs> so, I started to do performances quite late. I, I have born 52 after Second World War. So my childhood was very fine because war was over. And my, my father also was a very young man when he was in the war. Uh, but 1966, uh, uh, my father died. And I started to live together with my mother, and my mother was so unhappy. Uh, he was, she was also 41, like my father, when he died. So I started to be a little better in school because of mother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is the reason why I started to, started to be good in maths. I didn't know that uh, mathematics is the area of me. I really didn't know, but when I started to be active in school, I found it. And then 71, like perhaps here, when you are 19, you finish the school. So um, I have been in an um, art club in school, but the idea to, to go to study art, no, in a small city where I have born, nobody went to study art. You know? So I wanted to go out of home, so I went to study mathematics. So it was 70, yes, and you said left, left, yes. Everybody we were against Vietnam War and everything. So I found my my husband who was of the same ideas. I did I did say okay, Marxist millennialism and so on. So red flags. So 74. I was uh, 21 and husband Pekka, who is, who is still together with me, was 19. And we started to be together, we found each other in the bar, together with friends, red flags, friends. <laughs> so uh, he told me that uh, his poem and artist, I said, crazy guy, who is that? I thought that everybody had students and so on. I was so in, in student life. So that was very important moment in my life. 
to start to live in artists. So that is why I followed <coughs> 80s art. I started. But my first performance, 89, so I was quite old when I started. I was at 37. So it was at the opening of my husband's exhibition. So then came 90s. So I was a little woman of 90s also. Feminist. <laughs> I don't want to be the woman behind the man. No. Yes. I took the name in my optimist and it was 91. And then that, that it started to go on and shortly we come to this lapa. Because in 90s I was really feminist and so on and I had strong performances. But 20, 2000, 2000, in Helsinki there was a Rivara, one quite famous performance artist. But he decided to uh, invite every Finnish performance artist to Helsinki. Quite many came. So, uh, one year or two years later, it was one year later, he invited the whole world and <laughs> it was to Helsinki. And it was like, like, uh, Woodstock, and we were really <laughs> full of performances. Was the asset brown? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, mm. Yes. <laughs> 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 but because, uh, because uh, in Finland, 90s, I was really a lot. Roy was living in Berlin, so in Finland, not so many people were living there. So I, the area was for me. But uh, he came back to Finland, living to Helsinki again, and then. Uh, I started together with my son to, to have an own place, this um, underground place, La Bar, you know. Mm -hmm. Down there. Yeah, yes, down there. <coughs> and uh, small events only, and we cooperated together with this for Roy's festivals and everything. But uh, then it just uh, coming, became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we have these piano's. But uh, <coughs> and, uh, I could do. Uh, Talk a lot of it and everything, but but uh, ten year ten years is quite a good um, amount of time. If you um, uh, have uh, power to do performances, strong performances, ten years, okay, it's okay. You can continue. And also, if you organize, uh, I know so many performance festivals. They have been ten years. And, uh, so, so I, I think that um, I will continue with everything. And then, last thing, mathematics. Yeah, so yeah. it was because 90s, I wanted to be so strong woman. So of course I must do doctoral dissertation of mathematics. It belongs also to my life. Yeah, I think that's quite idiosyncratic and fascinating. Um, so many people tend to separate mathematical ability from like verbal ability and visual literacy and I fail to understand those separations a little myself because I think I can't think of anything more mathematical than language or music or visual arts but I think it, you have this you know mathematics is thought to be the language of maddening logic as opposed to intuition and here you are mathematical and proud I admire that. We'll come back to that later I think. Um, Teresa um, I'd like to ask you in some ways about your, you know, your background, some of your formative years, and also Polar Produce, which is an intriguing email address. <laughs> um, actually, there's, there's some crossovers between, between our backgrounds. Uh, I grew up in Ireland, in the middle of the country, in quite a small rural village, about a thousand people. And in Ireland, you leave secondary school quite early, at 16 and 17. And I knew I had one feeling, and that was, yeah, get out, <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which was the main thing. And uh, I decided also at that time to, to move to Glasgow, to Scotland, where I studied. Um, I don't have any formal arts background in our training. Which I, I haven't. I went to university. Um, I should also say that it was probably an interesting time to make the decision to leave Ireland. Um, not that I was very, you know, uh, aware of that kind of decision making at that particular time, but 
Ireland was in a period of economic boom and growth and it, I wasn't of the generation of Irish people that had to leave. I was uh, born in a period of Ireland of quite kind of uh, wealth and the Celtic Tiger, exactly. So nobody really uh, of my age was actually um, making that decision at that time. Um, anyhow, that's just a side really. So I went to Glasgow and I studied psychology and actually theatre studies. So I guess when I say I have uh, a practical formal uh, arts training, uh, theatre studies in Glasgow was, was quite academic and it was coming from the English department. Um, but I had, um, I started to just, just hang out a lot with artists in, in Glasgow, there's a really good art school there, and um, also hang out with people who are at the university who are making a lot of music as well. So I was living with a bunch of musicians who were setting up sound systems and growing up with bass spins and all of that kind of thing and making our own instruments and I kind of got into a role and set up Polar Produce when I was a student at that time to, in a sense... Um, Excuse me, where's the name come from? It came from some nights sitting around together thinking, we had, we had a manifesto, right? <laughs> <laughs> As all, as all good, you know, young things have a manifesto. So our manifesto was that we would, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity was key, key to it, and poles being separate opposite poles uh, coming together. And also I was reading a text by Peter Brook at the time where the pole was <coughs> symbol, it, it has a symbolism within certain traditions, like the male pole or the totem pole, yeah. where it actually, um, allows for the invisible to be to be visualized so this um, kind of all, all appealed to to me really in a way so polar park produce was born at that time and essentially during my student days uh, i was in a capacity of setting up I wouldn't call them live art events, but we would work in clubs, the dance floor and music is always something that has been quite central to, to my life and um, the dynamics of the dance floor as well and club culture, so we were kind of setting up, it was also the early stages of VJing, so we were setting up environments where we would be mixing video art with live art with music um, and kind of creating club environments in that way. Um, never really, I'm quite also making the choice not to produce or to uh, cre create events in formal spaces but in kind of club spaces, community centres. More social spaces. More social spaces, exactly. So that was the beginning and uh, I came out of that academic period and I did a master's as well and that was in music therapy with young people who had learning difficulties and I started to go down this academic path essentially if I have a training or background since it is as a social educational psychologist. I also went on to do a PhD which crosses over to Irma's background and that was looking at how we uh, create collaborative, creative collaborative processes when you're working with technology. I kind of went down, it was kind of going down quite a digital route for me because of that work with within Polar Produce and working with a lot of digital artists and electronic artists as well. Came out of that academic period. Um, this is also moving around a lot predominantly in England and Wales, but after, after my master's, I also spent a period of time where there was a professor of performance studies called Mike Pearson who I was lucky to do a workshop with during my student days and Mike is a very very interesting um, man and also sort of became a guest to some extent a mentor. There was, he was from that tradition of um, site specific theatre, live art, avant-garde, European tradition really in a way which really appealed to me because again there weren't creating work in, in formal spaces but um, in these social or public spaces and I wrote to him and I said okay I don't know if you remember me but I did a workshop with you and he said yes I remember you and I said okay I want to come and work with you <laughs> and that was it and I started to work with them in a parallel to doing my PhD and that led to a period of work with Welsh live artists and performing artists crossing over into visual art um, photojournalism and kind of experimenting more with image and performance, photography and, and performance. And I guess in one way for me those experiences um, 
professional experiences, working in a professional capacity with these people was my training ground alongside working with my peers and learning by doing. So I come from a really DIY space really where you just go out and you do it and you kind of got a bit of a punk attitude to it all really um, and learn by making. So when I kind of came out of the academic period and kind of came out of that period of learning with Mike, Mike Brooks and, and, the, and the Welsh performance crew, I I guess I had come to a point where it was like, okay, well, what do I want to say? And what what does my work now take? What kind of form does it take? Um, and resurrected Polar Produce and formalised it then as a company and started to kind of, I've always had this parallel uh, existence working within research labs or kind of quasi-academic spaces, but continued to do that and then also work uh, more concentrating more on polar produce and the type of work that we were doing. This is around 2005. Was you know medium to large scale mixed media, intermedia, or integrated media, public performances. Again, commenting quite a lot on technology, consumer culture, production processes, bringing in bits of hardware and software that would be used in those contexts, for example, radio frequency identification tags, which are like used in Walmart and in um, Oyster cards to tag your your trail as you go through um, and buy goods and kind of bringing them into the kind of the performance. Um, but then kind of stood back a little bit from that kind of work and started to kind of think, what am I doing? Um, we were getting supported and well supported to make this work as well, like questioning I guess not so much the production values but the kind of um, consequences of getting certain amounts of money, the expectations of what's placed on you as an artist when you do get that support, uh, the types of partnerships that we were making, what did that actually mean? What did actually producing pieces of work that had large scale displays mean in terms of kind of an ecological question? And I just started to kind of think a little bit about that and almost pull back a wee bit from that larger scale type of work and to make more uh, smaller pieces. I should just say that Polar Produce at this point, between 2005, from 2005 to kind of now, is there, it's a collective. It's 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 a collective of about three people, and we constantly work together. It's Kathy Hind, who's an audiovisual artist. She works a lot as well. Each one of these people have their own very 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 strong line of practice as well, and are quite successful in their own areas. Uh, Kathy Hind, Philip Dwyer, who's graphic and interaction design. Martin Delash is not with us anymore, but he was sort of like technical kind of back end cons um, programming and so forth. And then I was more on the conceptual directorial kind of side of it as well, uh, looking at the admin too. So, um, yeah, going back, back to that point of kind of trying to bring it to, to smaller works, so it was around. Yeah, which seems to be a direction you're moving in yeah. with your current body of work here. I'd like to move to Agnes for a second, for about several seconds, numerous seconds probably. <laughs> and, you know, like also do a parallel thing with your background, where you came to be where you were, and also talk about some of your workshops, and your collaborations, and your interest in developing performance. There's, there's actually a quote from the pamphlet you gave me that I would like to, uh, when I'm starting off with in a way, like, Many of the artist's works are grounded in a performative response to the potency of a given space. And it, it's all yours. <laughs> You're throwing a lot of things in there. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that it, I, I think it's quite interesting to hear, like, your, you both started quite early, right, with your stories. And I think that's interesting in terms of we've been discussing uh, the cultural background of people or individual backgrounds and, and how. Um, what happens with that in the in the moment of performance in terms of the audience and the performer? You understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll say a little bit about that as well. I grew up in Bergen in Norway, which is uh, uh, kind of 250,000 people on the west coast of Norway. It's the second largest city in Norway, actually. 
recimo. Imamo ne forme ne vidimo. All together. Um, and I grew up in a very, very strict religious uh, Presbyterian. And um, when I finished school, about 18, uh, I also felt that desperation of getting out. So what I did was to <coughs> hitchhike around Europe in a street position. And later I realized, maybe this is linked after me wanting to perform later. Um, and, um, yeah, and then in my 20s, I was a competition climber, like um, really serious about sport climbing. Um, and then when That's a big I... Big achievement. <laughs> That's quite, whoa, big. Yeah, but it was, it was a really big part of my life, I really enjoyed it. And, but the, then what happened was that I studied um, in art school, uh, textiles art. And I was not a very good textile artist. You know, when they... <laughs> When they asked me to weave things, I went to the scrapyard and I got all these cables and metals and stuff. And they were like, maybe you should consider working with some finer materials. And like, Why? Well, maybe the fact that you're mixing the fine and the rough materials is an interesting departure point. Yeah, but what, what I realized that when I finished textiles, I had a really up here. I really uh, didn't enjoy it so much, but it's really kind of informed a relationship to material. And, um, and uh, it's coming more and more into my practice now, actually. Mm -hmm. But then I left to go to Glasgow to, uh, to do a Master's of Fine Art. And for me, it was really wonderful. They told me immediately, like, you know, forget everything you learn and just go out and do whatever you want. Uh, and, uh, and also, they were like, God, you're so physical. Well, when I was living in Norway, I was living in a house with people who would, like, who would go um, skiing across Greenland, but instead of going around, because that was too short, we'd go in figure eight, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you know, or sea kayaking in the whole coast of Norway, or uh, go to Pakistan and stuff and die in the mountains. Like, really, really hardcore, hardcore people. So, in that context, I wasn't very physical. So, I was a bit surprised uh, that, that this was. Uh, but I thought, okay, I'll try to use that. And actually I started off, so my performance kind of career, I already had done some workshops and were a little bit interested, but, but I realized that I could use this physicality, you know, as a... And the first things I did was, uh, it was kind of a difficult time in my life, I sort of broke up uh, a relationship and things were a little bit hard. Uh, and I felt like I had to sort of master so many things. So I went out and bought a Superman t-shirt. And, <laughs> and then I went on my bike and I just, kind of play this superhero that wasn't really a superhero, you know, I was constantly failing and falling and all this things. <laughs> and that was sort of the beginning, and then it started, and then it's the connection with space stuff. That was really important for me, physicality in relation to space. Yeah, and specific then it's, space. Yeah, Psychic to the specific space. spaces. And, um, that and part sort of the wall from there. Is, is infinitely different than that part of the wall. The very small in particular. I don't know what. The, the, the relationship to space was important for me in the beginning, but uh, I think it's, it's also other issues that have come into it later. Kind of thing. Yeah, and you want me to talk about one well, workshop? Uh, yeah, well, it's not, well, the workshop you did here is pretty funny. I think. Of which perform or process performances, and there were presentations, but the process yeah. was in many ways the crux of it. There were there were some presentations mm -hmm. last Thursday, last Friday, and then last Thursday, unfortunately. Yeah. No, it was a nice group. Uh, well, what I have one kind of thing that I really like to do is like seeing a situation and people are like, okay, this situation, this people, this ding 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 ding, we put it together and it works. And I think this is part of the reason why I like to teach as well. It's like trying to make things come together. And also, I really, really enjoy the sort of contact with the, with the students and, and try to kind of tease out to them, what's your thing? You know, what's, and who are you? elements that come into the picture. Hmm? Random elements that yeah, come yeah, into absolutely. the picture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Give you some, you know, audiences or how the presence of audience will affect the truth of it. So, the light changes, so now it's the yeah. Changes. Yeah, in this, in this workshop I was talking, uh, I was kind of going through the relationship to space, relationship to material, relationship to, 
to the other body yeah. uh, and to uh, time and memory and, and the encountering with yourself and meeting the other. So, um, so I was talking a lot about how the space changes in terms of who's there and what they're bringing to the situation. So this is also quite an important sort of ingredient in my own practice uh, that, what, that makes performance art uh, a very specific genre. But I might talk about that. Yeah, um, I'm just approach generally, but one thing I, so I think that the three of you do have in common is a tendency maybe to want to deflate the heroic, to maybe flirt with the heroic and then want to deflate it, work against it, move towards the smaller, the particular, away from the grand gesture and towards the very now specific gesture. Am I completely out to lunch or am I sensing a commonality? <coughs> Yes, I think that uh, you are right. Is that about lunch? <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, uh, this kind of work in IT is so hard. And at the beginning of 2000, uh, and uh, by my complicated performances and with computers and everything, uh, everything was really against. <laughs> but um, uh, because my area in, in mathematics is chaos theory, so fractal, your Norway. This is such a very interesting territory right there, chaos theory and mathematics. <laughs> I mean, I can't, chaos, I mean, you know way more about chaos theory than I do. Chaos theory is obviously supremely mathematical. Somebody, not somebody might superficially say that's oxymoronic. Chaos, you know, which is not chaos theory, chaos and, and mathematics. So, yes, I just had to get that in. Keep going. Yes, it's very really interesting that the uh, chaos, in my way, is uh, is the probabi probability. No, but it's uh, it, it, it is the idea in inside dynamical mathematical model. It only comes from there. And then we have this another kind of okay, yes, it's totally different. It's a, it is interesting this word, it is not good word, I think. <laughs> Complicated is better like this uh, chaos, chaotic. Uh -huh. Because chaos uh, we think in another way when we talk of chaos. But um, or but it's very fine you can put this kind of ideas to performances because female people even they are so chaotic. <laughs> and yes, but I think that man thinks only there's two points. One is here and one is here. Ah. And these are many ideas I have done. Yes, we have Special a thanks for men and so on. Yes, I have really <laughs> created something like that. But uh, you can do this as a woman because men, they are so powerful. They just laugh and they take it. Yes. They really think it. They understand it. <laughs> that they have only two points. Because they, they, <laughs> because they have even claimed, I must say, in mathematics. You, you know my area, mathematics. What is the day when we women can be over the man, over men in mathematics? No, no. They are, when they think they are really, really, because they call it this, they are good in that. But uh, if there is some problem, everything goes here and there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say, it, but in my performances, I have, I have I tried to explain. <laughs> oh, <neither. laughs> he was once in my performance, and now it is very funny to meet you again. It was 14 years ago. You probably remember more than I do. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Uh, about the, well, I'll pick up from, or do you want to say no, something? No, no, no. Andrew, do you want to say something? No, no. Um, the hero and the, and the chaos, in, in a way. I mean, if, if I think of uh, the connections with what Irma has said, and I guess that starting point is from a psychological kind of perspective. I'm, I'm not uh, so concerned with, with um, trying to create work that accentuates or discusses the differences 
between men and women, mm -hmm. but more actually about what it means to be human in this in this world and what it means to to try to actually in some way um, deal with. I would agree with Erna, the complexity as opposed to the chaos. And that's always about trying to understand human environment interrelationships and how different layers overlap for us to create uh, and express our attitude, which for me is our presentation of our being or our self in the world. So this is kind of, I guess, some of the things that I am obsessed with a little bit and what are the strategies of survival that we <clears throat> use or adopt and those strategies can be anything from language to how we move to how we dance to how we we formulate our, our, our projection in, in the world. So multiple possible interpretations of random encounters. Yeah, yeah. And how how my being then uh, overlaps with your subjectivity and how we in some way start to construct what we agree here is a room of people and all, all of these details. So against the kind of the heroics, for me those things are constructed on a very detailed level and this, these small acts of great significance, which is the title of the performance I will do here, I guess is a good representation maybe, or a good title for my, representing where I'm thinking at the moment. And whether you want to interpret that as something against the, the hero, it's not something I thought about explicitly, but it's not a bad it, you're not out to lunch, is what I'm saying as well. No, the grand gesture to me is big and full of holes and missing a lot of significant details. Yeah, and also, what, what in the end and they do we remember? Quite easily. Yeah, yeah. Bad architecture. Yeah. 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 yeah, one, but one thing I wanted to say in relationship to these issues that come up, you know, about uh, sort of, um, well, when I, uh, I'm quite aware that I'm Norwegian, right? And uh, and that uh, I have uh, great privileges in the world, <coughs> being a white female uh, of, uh, and my age and everything, that it's, that I have privileges in the world mm -hmm. when I'm moving around, and um, uh, and I'm very uh, and you talked about this relationship to men and women and stuff, and I, I think for me um, it's important because I come from Scandinavia, you know, which makes makes it really like I have all doors open for me. I feel, mm -hmm. but this is not this is not come for free. I'm really aware that somebody fought for these things for me. And, uh, and I feel a great responsibility to take advantage of all of that. Uh, I have to use it all and kind of, well, what I'm feeling is that I would like to inspire also others to sort of use their, their, their spectrum of possibilities and uh, what you want, how you want to be in the world. Like I've also done like really heavy um, kind of industrial work, right? And it's, to me that's totally normal. And that's something you can do as a female in Norway, but you cannot do that everywhere. What do I you mean to travel around? You backtrack a town. Yeah. What industrial work specifically? No, kind of like uh, scaffolding, yeah, yeah, building yeah. things, boat building, like yeah. all sorts of stuff, and also the climbing thing, of course, is very sort of male dominated. But I mean, for me, it's not been an issue that it is male dominated because it's open to me. I can do whatever I want. Um, and I think, I think this is really important also to be aware of that because. Uh, because it's so recent that we have, that I have, would have these possibilities that if I don't use them, I might, the next generation might risk losing. But one can use them without being possessive of them or 
through without being, I have these options and you don't. No, 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 it's more like yeah. a playful thing. Like, yeah, yeah. hey, no, come no, on, no, let's, no. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, no, and no, it's no. A, not a negative, not a negation, like not against. Yeah. It's like, okay, this door is open. Yeah, I'm yeah. Use it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. On that note, I think we'll open the floor. Um, does anybody from the floor wish to jump in and talk about performances and heroes and space and nooks and crannies? Well, I, I was curious about um, something I think about sometimes because, you know, that, uh, having done some art teaching, you see these students who come in and, you know, they're studying art and that's what they're doing and often they want to be art teachers themselves. But, but I, I'm always go back to something that uh, when I was of the age, most people go to university, although I wasn't going myself, but my friends who were all in university, I had one friend who was studying journalism, and years later, uh, she actually became a, a, a priest. And she said, you know, now my education makes much more sense to me because I have some kind of background. When I was a journalist, I was studying journalism as a practice, but there was nothing to inform it. And I think it's interesting, like even though with mathematics or you even with the physicality or, or you know, psychology, these other kinds of theoretical thinking or practical experience other kind of seem to inform to some extent what you do. And I think it's sort of interesting to think about that sense of art in itself. It could be anything, but it needs some kind of basis you know, because if it's just about expression or about what, whatever <coughs> it's about, you know, but what's it talking about other than just art itself? I think it's more interesting than something else. <laughs> totally. Yes, yes, uh, that was very interesting for me because I was lecture. So I had the, um, because I have always been in business school, mathematician in business school is back. <laughs> It's complicated also. And so if you are sitting there and if I teach mathematics, they hate it. But they must have uh, one course for everyone. I'm teacher of that in that, that university. So when I, when I teach here like this, and I have a projector, I love it. I have used it many times in performances. And they are looking like that. So uh, I got many, many ideas, like this Ilma Optimist artist name, because they are so optimistic people, those <laughs> economic students. <laughs> <laughs> this world will be everything else yes, is going, this stock market is going up, 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 and everything will be fine, fine, fine. But the, yes, I got a lot of ideas of that, and because I have not seen so many performances in the 80s in Finland, some Finnish, some Finnish performances. Uh, so, but I understand what it can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, 91 black, black market and something else happened in Helsinki. And that was last time that they can those men. <laughs> no, but yeah. I've always thought there was a relationship between the stock market and fluxes, you know, up and down, whoa, random. <laughs> okay, but well, that's the male in your Marxist name. <laughs> yes, yes, but so that I, I thought because I was really researching this case theory, and I thought that this is dynamical <coughs> system, this this area when you you do your performance. So I tried to do it very complicated, many things very complicated, and so on. And now I I, I do very simple performances. I started with very complicated. But in math mathematics, I was very abstract, like you know. And now I'm in the point that uh, yes, I'm really, you will see, not so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but picking up on what Paul said, I think that I also, yeah, agree, basically, that the, the discourse, the science discourse, that dominated psychology, even though I was in a very progressive um, social psychology department, which was led by some amazing female academics, which I'd like to kind of go back to the point that Agnes raised in a minute, but um, even those methodologies within psychology seemed to me to be quite limiting at a point where I was kind of like, if 
if your interest is in understanding human expression within the world, then this doesn't satisfy me enough. And the discourse of academia in terms of the validity or reliability of, of um, quantifying our experiences was also really limiting. There is just some things that are not explainable on that level. And uh, so yes, I would say that it kind of it, it allows me to, it, it gives me a structure to react against and to wait all of the time. In, yeah, even if it's not always conscious in each piece. It seems to also be a bit of a piece of a preference you've expressed for work on location and outside of, is, you know, out, not so much inside the institutions and blurring separations between the above the day and the everyday. Yeah, thank Agnes. you. <laughs> <laughs> Agnes, you were going to... Uh, yeah, about the yeah. I don't know if I have very much to add, but I think it's a, it's a really important point, though, that, um, well, I think I'm quite interested in this idea about the proximity between life and art, and how we, uh, how we discuss that within performance art. Um, and, the, and the fact that what are we actually talking about, right? I think I'm, I'm really, really concerned that the work that I see, I would like to see that the, whoever is making that work needs to make that work, has a desire to make that work, has a desire to say something, to do something. Humble magic. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think it's important, and if you, if you, uh, if you sort of, uh, if you, if you go through education or art school uh, through. Uh, for many, many, many years, and you start really early, so you don't really have any other experiences without it. it obviously, what happens is that you start recycling the issues that are already there. And what is that actually saying about being human in the world? Right? I think that is, is what is interesting about art, is, is that we have a position where we can actually sort of step outside and, want, and look at things and comment. And we have the liberty of doing that Whatever, in whatever way we want, we don't have to. We don't have to relate to academia, sort of, yeah. uh, sort of rules and regulations about how we do it. And, and and I think we should also take that sort of seriously too, that we have that uh, freedom. Yeah, it's good to know the rules, and so we can break them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we don't really have any rules, or we do, or we have a discourse, and we belong to a tradition, of course. But I mean. Uh, and we, have, we work with the translation and transformation of life issues into, so it becomes art. But I mean, uh, still, it's, it's, I think it should be about something that means. Yes, we, yes we, uh, we have, we have boundaries, but uh, this is, like line, is it, uh, is it fractal? Exactly, so it's full of everything, but we have some, some, some rules. We know them. If we look at some performance, we can say, oh, this is not so good. So we have some kind of idea what are they, but we, don't, we can't write them. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but <laughs> something, is, something else. <laughs> some, perhaps some uh, who is doing that thinks that it's performance, but we performance artists, we say, that's not performance. So, but inside the performance, everything can happen. But you know what I mean. I have a sense. Yes, go ahead. No, yeah. It, it, what, I was, what I was trying to say about the, the, we belong to a tradition and a, and a sort of institutions or whatever that makes those boundaries for us. But, but I mean, in terms of content and in terms of, how, of what we want to comment on, uh, we, we have a lot bigger space. The places we do performances, they can have also many limits. It's very interesting. <laughs> you go to some festival and they say many limits for you, that you must be inside them. It's something I was, I was thinking about um, and talking about with Cindy and Anne over the last few days and before we got here, the, the, the borders and the limits. Um, and in fact, Maurice asked a really good question after the performance the other night, you know, what, how is it different working with a collective than working by yourself? And I realized <clears throat> I set up my own blocks to myself, such as like, particularly working alone, and I wonder if this is the case, if it's come up for any of the three of you, how as a performer, I do, I do this, I don't do that. So, 
um, there are certain ways of working that you think, okay, so-and-so does that kind of performance work, but I don't do that kind of performance work. So I create a block of, okay, so I can't do that thing, get, come up with an example. I don't get naked, so it's not something I would do in the performance. That's just an example. But what if suddenly you have a performance that calls for it? Yeah, collaboration. Do I both. think do I think that oh right, but I don't really do that. And I'm thinking not even a collaboration on my own, but suddenly there's this idea right. that comes and well, wait, but I don't do like I don't cut myself, but suddenly I feel like I need to cut myself. So I don't know if the question is clear. Do you feel as though because you understand you get used to yourself being <laughs> a certain way. And other people for that matter who are used to seeing you perform in certain ways. What happens when you suddenly come out and do something else? Are people going to look at that and say, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> who are you now? Do I, have, do I give myself permission to just try something else because it's something I don't usually do? Uh, I believe very much in uh, following your nose. But I also feel a little bit like a baby. It's only five years since I graduated and sort of started working professionally. I did also do work kind of professionally already before, but still. Um, <coughs> but uh, but I really tried to sort of free myself from that and just following the nose. And of course, you you are yourself with your own history, with your own sort of issues. So uh, so we would, I don't think it's a good idea to sort of be totally random and like oh I've never done that so I should do that. But I mean, not to limit yourself. Uh, and I really like this kind of notion, like wherever the nose is pointing. So if I feel like cutting myself, I'll do that even though I've never done it before and it doesn't feel like something has been, it hasn't come up before. And I also, uh, I work collaboratively with um, an aero acrobat, a girl from Brazil. And, and that's really interesting because she comes from a completely different sort of area. And we're trying to find like how can we join these things that we are concerned with. And that sometimes challenges me to do things that are like, oh, I didn't think I'd do that. But, it, but, but it's more like a, a learning process, you know? Because uh, I feel kind of as well that it's learning, 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 learning. It's great. And I know I'm strong enough in the things that I believe in that I don't worry about whether it's going to go in that direction or that direction because it's always from me. Yes, <laughs> yes I, I, I have an idea of that, because in Finland we have advanced performance education. It was four years long, and um, the man who ran it was from England. But he was so good in that uh, teaching process. Ten students, so they are really nearly everybody. They are really uh, in good level and doing performances. Uh, and they are very strong. and. It was uh, not this, uh, this level that you will become master of, of uh, uh, the level under that, how you say, uh, Yes, but they went to other art schools, and, but uh, they are doing, they are good, but they are doing, uh, how to say, basic performance art. <laughs> there is some kind of basic, I don't know how to say, no, no big risks or something like that. But you, if you see, you say, okay. But here's that basic functional versus grand or large scale, or there has to, you know, expectations, or there has to be something spectacular, or does there sort of question? Yes, I like to look. I started I like to, to do spectacles. Spectacles. Yes, really. I want to take this museum. I do very, very one hour is enough. Yes, but. Yes, and for me, duration of performance is quite impossible. So, <laughs> that story, I, mean, I have always some story. So, but uh, yes, but not all the time. So, I come in here to some small and like this. Uh, you can't do spectacles all your life. If you perhaps sometimes. Mm -hmm. No, I found that spectacle like in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we, yeah, just in answer to Victoria's question about yeah. setting limits. I mean, it's funny, I feel I'm sitting between Irma Optimist and, and Agnes uh, Superhero. <laughs> so, in that line, I feel like, uh, yeah, Teresa impossibilities are in that. Yeah, I, I don't ever seem to see something as impossible. And, and whether you think of that as a good thing or not, I'm not sure. But I would be 
take the same line as Agnes in terms of the following off your nose and also feeling like I'm always beginning a little bit. I'm, I'm not, um, uh, I feel I'm not really established in any one discipline or genre uh, uh, enough that there's a, a big, I don't have the weight of a particular identity on my shoulders that I have, uh, yeah, I have to carry. And that has been, that is something that I'm actually, I have constructed as well, because I work within sand art and I work within music and then live art and theatre and then I also, you know, have, have a job, a nine to five job at the moment. And to, to kind of get to a point where you can manage those those things because we all have different lives that we're leading. You might be a mother or you might be, you know, a wife or a husband or a lover or, you know, you have to manage many different identities anyway. But, but I think that um, for me it's kind of important that I still feel, feel some of those freedoms rather than those limits um, that, you know, that are defining what I am making. So these expectations, they are that. Yeah. If you start to do big things and so on and complicated, so the, the audience expects that you will do yeah. these kind of things. And if you do something small, okay, I don't know, I have, I have uh, had no critics of that, but I can, I can uh, understand that it's a, it's a fact if you, if you start to do from here, and then you'll come from here, <laughs> but, uh, to here. Uh, but uh, uh, it's very interesting when we are women, and I'm the oldest, and uh, I do old women's performances, and others is there. I don't know how to do it. I don't To go back to the point that I just raised about uh, what, what, what you inherit uh, as, as a female art. Uh, artist or just as a female in, in the period that we would have grown up, I think it's, um, I'm very, uh, very aware that it's people like Irma that have allowed for the possibilities of the freedoms that I probably have um, been given to, to, to allow to move in the way that I have and I think that that was kind of a hard battle that was fought at certain points. Um, by different people and I was lucky in the department, the academic department that I also kind of grew up a bit in to, to be with, to see also some of the sacrifices that some people had made to allow for, you know, to feel a bit free and, un, you know, unlimited in a sense and, uh, and I think that it is a very uh, delicate thing to have, to, to feel that and huge privilege and how do we kind of maintain that not just for ourselves as female artists but also allow others um, to, to feel that as well uh, and I think that that's, that's kind of quite an interesting thing that when we start to speak about expectations or when we start to speak about um, strategies or infrastructures that can be established or projected upon any art discipline or person that start to hinder that um, and that can be anything from, you know, a particular type of a mayor, mayor being voted into a city to <laughs> um, funding being cut on different levels, etc., etc. So, yes, it's so uh, it's too difficult to kind of promise it. Now we are like competitors. Uh, to say yes, we, we three, for example, I will do performance tomorrow, Agnes today, and you on Saturday. When you are in a festival, it's a little difficult. You, uh, you, you are one of many. You are, you are not the private, to do your private show. So if you want to really to do something strong and everything, so you must do something by yourself alone somewhere. But uh, this is very interesting when you are organizer. Also, Agnes is organizer. You haven't said another word of that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we started late yesterday, you always. Okay, but I think that perhaps you are the woman who will continue in the area of that organizing. So when you are organizer, you must think a little bit what kind of evenings you build. Because then if, if you you are not always right. <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. it's going like this, but sometimes it is quite fine and it is one one evening's 
performance then then you then you think then uh, together the performances for you. Well, they have the university courses in curating. Oh, what do I have? I, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm like a, a teacher in mathematics, in econ economic mathematics. And my economy, my mathematics, my money is... <laughs> so if somebody said, should send me how to organize um, festivals, <laughs> I never could do that because always it's mine or something. <laughs> If I, if I speak money, but, uh, but uh, what is inside is always good because I have good friends all over the world. They come to Finland, we have not much money like you uh, here, but that is another problem. We don't speak money. Money is so bad thing to speak. I started it, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those subjects you can't get away from another capitalist or a socialist society. Yeah, yeah, he said um, about this organizing thing. Yeah, I'm organizing actually. For the f I have organized a couple of smaller events, but I'm organizing quite a large festival in January in Norway. But for me, it's quite important. I'm an artist, and I said before, I like when I can say, "You, you, you, this, wait, we have got something." And for me, it's uh, it's about finding myself in a situation where I'm involved with a large new venue in Bergen. Uh, so I have somewhere. I have a place. And I've been teaching, so and Norway has a small performance art scene, there's very little performance to see. And there's quite a few of my ex-students who are very hungry for this art form. And I want to, uh, and I want to help them. And also, they want to help me. So I've got like a bunch of people who want to work with me and volunteer. And also I have so many good friends. So I wish I could invite everybody. But, uh, I think I have to do something. I've seen it already, so yeah. it's always manhood. Mm. But I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing 30 artists every weekend. I think that's big enough for like a beginner. I mean, uh, but it's really like trying to do something for the art scene, for the performance art scene in Norway, trying to do something for my old students. There's always been a tradition of artists working in disciplines which are not which are considered to be somewhat out of way disciplines, to take themselves, take on the responsibilities of organizing and curating. I mean, I've done a bit of this as primarily a video artist. Other people in this room have taken on curatorial initiatives because they themselves want to see work and they also want to, you know, they may want to ultimately, their, their purpose is not necessarily to contextualize their own work officially, but I think that is part also of taking on curatorial and programming initiatives. There's always been that tradition also with disciplines that are not painting or sculpture, not to pick on them because I love them, or even photography. Um, to the DIY aesthetic, you know, like don't wait for the government to do it, don't wait for, you know, the corporations to do it, do it ourselves and build up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's honorable tradition, the more the better. Yeah, I, I didn't realize, I, I also do uh, organizing stuff, so I didn't realize. <laughs> um, but, but that called community building in a way, and um, probably, I, I have been doing it a, a lot since I was really young actually, and from, from the club nights right, right through now to, to festivals. And um, it's also slightly a little bit about um, maybe you might find yourself in a locality and just agreeing with, with what you were saying actually Andrew like that you may not have producers or curators who you feel actually understand where the perspective that you're coming from and yet at the same time you know that there's like-minded people out there that might be dotted around your locality in other ways or in your wider national network or on an international network and it, it's it's also part of your your self education that DIYness in a way to kind of create um, a more coherent coherency that you can lie back into and feel com feel comfortable. You know, it might be that you're actually connecting more with somebody that's in electronics than maybe actually is in live art, just because of the attitude and the way that they make their work or how they're. Yeah, and the nature of the disciplines often are collaborative in nature, anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, um, performance artists are not generally studio-bound hermetic painters. Mm -hmm. But are we 
collaborative by nature? I tend to avoid things about nature myself. <laughs> I have a question for you, man. You can only, I think, especially for you, man, because I'm stalking, I have a personal interest. I have started to make collaborations or, or things with my partner, Julia. And I've been asking, have you ever done this with Pekka? I mean, he, he only, also only have two things in mind. <laughs> <laughs> you are right. Have I, you done it or have you done it? Really, no, I, I, I practice this idea with, with, with him. him yeah. And you still together? Yeah, it's good in philosophy. It's good in philosophy, it's so funny. Baba means down there, yeah. yeah, yeah. But how do you feel this, Irma? Okay. How did you, how, how did you experience? I mean, okay, yes. Like I said, I started because I was married with an artist and it is very important. And I really want to be, I took it seriously, yes, to be a good artist. But um, my husband, uh, it, it is now like that, that, that he's not doing so much anymore. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Now he's a theoretical person. And, uh, what do you mean he's all head and no body? <laughs> He's a little old now these days, but yes, so, go, uh, so uh, to organize together with him is not easy, but I, I started to organize everything together with the sun. Performing, not organizing. Organizing, yeah, no organizing together with Pekka. So, uh, exactly. yeah, oh, but organizing okay. together with, with Lowry. Lowry was the man who who saw that I have um, a studio in Cable Factory in the basement. So when you are a young man, like he was 20, why don't you use that space? Uh, that was the starting point. And uh, it is very easy for me to organize together with the sun. And if Pekka wants to organize, he, he organized some Lapa events, but uh, he do it, he does it by himself. No. No, yeah, yeah, it's uh, too difficult for me. Too many, too, this family project is too difficult. He's asking about not, not organizing, performing. Yeah. Yes, I have been performing. Uh, yes, once Paul Killard invited us to, this was his trance. Uh, so we didn't uh, perform together, but uh, we were two performance artists. artists. So we did uh, first me and then Becca or something like that. Once we went to hang, um, uh, what is that? Uh, Romania. Romania. Plus Napoca. Romania. So we did together. It was quite good. And we have had perhaps 10 or 5 performances. Uh, so really not many. And, uh, but a significantly small number. It's a very significant number, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is difficult, this art one. Yes, if you are an artist and you are together with another artist, you know, yes, it, it, is, it is a little bit difficult. So we have divided everything like this. Pekka, if he organizes, he organizes alone and he write, writes nowadays books and his philosophy. And, uh, and, and if I organize big things and everything, I organize together with my son. And then I really want to do performance uh, without son and husband. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that is interesting. And uh, I saw your performance together. It was very good in Helsinki. So perhaps you are good enough to do it. Perhaps it is better when you do it together than alone. I don't know. That's the point. Like in Black Mountain, I don't know, because I know that they are really good uh, artists as alone. But when you go to look when they are doing something slowly together, I think that it is uh, less than to someone else. But sometimes, I think, sometimes I think an artist's development or an artist getting bigger ultimately can mean that the artists themselves get smaller by, in a way, smaller by having less of themselves, sacrificing some of themselves, and actually entering into a collaborative process with another artist, which <coughs> might shrink you down to zero, but at the same time, ultimately, maybe bigger. Uh, and so again, one, I, don't, I forgot. When I started as Irma Optimist, I uh, started together with Toy Magic. <laughs> together one man, so uh, not another man. So I started together with another, and they were quite fine, but uh, then Tom Magic um, went to theater school and destroyed himself as performer star. I forgot that I started, started together with, uh, with uh, another. 
I'd like to say something about collaboration. <laughs> I think that the, uh, I believe that collaboration should come out of its, uh, of a communication. Like uh, our art form is a language, uh, a different language than we're the spoken language. And I find uh, when I collaborate, it's because I meet somebody and we are talking about something, and really, sort of, the issues that we're dealing with are interesting, but. Uh, but it, there's a need to sort of continue that discussion and, and to continue it between the art forms. So I quite often work with people in different art forms than myself to try and, because then you have a, a kind of a, a, a dialogue between the disciplines, but also a dialogue about the ideas. And then you can maybe create something that you impossibly, it would be impossible to create by yourself. Yeah. But I think uh, this is the way that collaboration can be really interesting, is if it's a dialogue, it's not just like, oh, uh, I like you and I want to collaborate with you, or like uh, because you're together, maybe, and you're both artists, maybe you should collaborate. Yeah. But, but if the dialogue can happen, that sounds them. great to me, actually, to regular. No, I, I again would just completely kind of agree. The dialogue, and for me also, it's about something that is uh, co created, that's a joint perspective that comes, you know, out of two different people's thinking processes. It's not something that's a, a coordination, you know, or a division of roles. Exactly. It shouldn't but, be contrived. I kind of sometimes uh, use infrastructures to set up a particular t kind of form of a collaboration to happen. Sometimes You're specific. Sort of doing that here anyway. Yeah, and, and sometimes for me it's just about also the, the failures of us joining our perspectives as much as, uh, you know, we can sometimes reach, I guess what you could say is a co-understanding, which is like, yes, I do agree and agree and agree and agree, but also it's about what we disagree. Mm -hmm. And what we disagree on is just as powerful. And that conflict sometimes is also the thing which I find is really interesting, that failure in a way. That, you know, we, we learn as much about where, where our differences are, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. You have to fail something, you have to set up something that is supposed to work or be successful in order for failure to be realized. I mean, I think it's beautiful the fact that you can actually think of, of human communication as failure all of the time. It's like, oh, God, you know, <laughs> you're kind of going like that all of the time. But, but it's, it's, it's kind of where we do touch each other. Or collide with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little curious what you mean by failure. Like, is, is that failure something that the audience would be aware of? Like, is it a failure to communicate to an audience, or is it a failure within the collaboration that maybe isn't evident to the audience? Or where is that failure that you're thinking about? Well, that's kind of what I was thinking also. Like, as you have to, if you set up a structure and then the structure somewhat fails to gel, is that what you mean? Well, there's a few, there's a few things to kind of. I guess I was talking in a very meta level there on, on, on kind of failure, but um, sorry, do you want to say something? Uh, well, it needs to. Yeah, no, but I can say, I can say. We're going to come back to that. You come back. You do come. You do come back. Yes, I think I'm coming old. I forgot that after Toymatic. He was quite dominated, so it was not so good, but uh, our people liked our, our performances. But after Toy Magic, uh, I had big group, I, I have forgotten everything. Many years, I have many young men and young women also, but, uh, but when you explain to, if you have big group, and you are together and you explain, so they wanted to, to hear me all the time and the ideas were mine. Then you, you are totally kaput when you must start the performance because you must explain, explain. Everybody, they come to ask, ask, and they, it's so difficult. So, but we did big spectacles with, with young, young men especially and some young women. And then uh, somebody invited me out also from Finland. It started to be like that. So I couldn't take the whole group together with me. So that's why I used like when you were in my performance that I took uh, people from the audience. What? Because I am drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, there was many, many 
problems. And just I saw in Helsinki one performance, and I saw because uh, there was one performance artist and two performance artists helping her, and they were so nervous, and it was really, uh, or they they finished it in the middle. <laughs> It was a catastrophe. It's very difficult to do group performances because if you know each other, you know if you have small some mark, some other. Oh, you have done very well. okay. A good example. Like you said. Okay, Paul, give it. Paul, Paul, and Ed, you did really fine performances together. Yes, because you knew each other well, and you were not. Difficult, difficult persons perhaps for each other because the audience, uh, audience uh, liked them to be very calm and fine and beautiful. So they, uh, Paul and Ed has fun clapping. But, but yeah, I mean, is not the difference between working two people and a group? Yes, you know, like. I also had a group for a while, and that was fine as long as I was a boss. Yes, right? you know how difficult. Um, I would just like to put the rest of that on the hot seat, but <laughs> uh, I thought your comment was, was very, very appropriate at the meta level, that all communication is failure, and I think you're right, that the best we can hope for is, well, what we experience is, we think we understand, we yeah. think we comprehend, and we can be sitting here nodding at each other like you and I are right now, but we're, the communication still isn't perfect. I still don't understand fully and completely what you're trying to communicate, but maybe you and I are sort of closer than others are on it. So that in that sense, all communication is failure. We can never understand exactly what someone else is trying to convey to us. So is it how we kill time? <laughs> I think we have we, something to communicate. We, we have nothing better, so we, we have to go with what we have got. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. I speak of communication now, not just verbal communication. Uh, you know, the, the, all, all our sensors on to communicate in a way. But do you want me to actually try to answer you there? <laughs> I do, but I was also very conscious of the fact that basically you were demonstrating a failure of communication, which was really a failure of agreement to even want to to have the conversation together in the sense of like, oh, I'm not even going to answer that. I think. No, I, I, needed, I needed a head break there for a second. <laughs> that's like a pause, deflection head break. <laughs> but that's, isn't that part of the failure of communication as well sometimes? You're not in the same place at the same time. At the same time, that is a small communication where you acknowledge that you cannot, you know, you cannot continue for a while or that you need a break, so you make a gentlewoman's agreement. Yeah. But, but yes, I want to hear. Uh, I, I guess there was a, there's a very particular thing that I'm thinking about. There, there was a whole raft of uh, education and research that came out at a particular time within education when I was, uh, yes, within education and psychology, when I was doing my thesis. And it was all very focused on joint interaction, joint attention, and collaborative processes and understanding that because uh, in England they were beginning to teach people how to be creative right and to do creative thinking skills and these types of skills were being embodied within the national curriculum okay so their definition of collaboration was kind of almost reaching a consensus right that it was right. and the emphasis was on shared understanding and when you look at that as the kind of, it, it, it's driving everyone to say that I have to come to a point where I say, right Paul, I agree, we agree, okay? But to, 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 to have synchronous communication and synchronous agreement all of the time is, that, that's just kind of not, not possible, right? And then there was a raft of us that were sort of like a, a bunch of people who were saying, okay, it's not just lying in what is synchronous, it's also in the, um, in the failure here, and it's in the conflict. Now this is, yeah, yeah. And it's what's underneath, it's what's underneath the surface. And, and, and it's, a, it's a fundamental principle of developmental psychology that it's within our, our the conflict that we actually cognitively, intellectually develop. That that's where, when there is dissonance, when there is a disjoint, when there is an, a, a tension between you and the other, you and society, you then actually have to stand back and process that and that's how you go forward, that's how you develop. And I think in terms of 
So when I say that that's where I'm thinking from a kind of a meta level, on a kind of purely structural or formal basis, in the work that I create, sometimes that's in there implicitly, but it's not always explicit. And when it is explicit, it's about actually <coughs> agreeing with myself as the kind of choreographer or, the, or as the structure maker of that particular performance that when there is discord, I'm going to just leave it there rather than trying to resolve it over the time. And let it, let it be, let it be present as an as a, as a element of the work. And, and, and people usually tend to either, they get that, or the, and, it's, and it's kind of like, it's a really nice thing, I think, when you start to acknowledge the weaknesses within something. You live with them. So, that's Can you rejoin yours? Well, Anne Bogart, um, although she comes from theater, um, she puts a really big emphasis on the dissonance of the community of theater workers that are working on a particular production as the most productive aspect of the work that they do together. So she apparently really um, encourages the disagreements among the people who are working together, not necessarily come to consensus, but to actually, in a sense, fight it out in order to then come to something that's a lot more vibrant in the final production, which is the performance. So she is talking about that, that's a very positive aspect in creating performance, that that place is the most productive place in creating collaborative performance for her. And it's interesting. Yeah, and it's interesting is your the, the take the additional layer that you've added to it is actually letting that discord sit there as part of the work. She doesn't take it that far, so it's really nice to have got these two pieces that are now put together. She talks about using it as a way to make the final production work, so that eventually what we see on stage in her theater context is something that's resolved. But you go somewhere else with it, which I find particularly interesting. You're taking that, you're saying, we, won't, we don't necessarily resolve the thing, we just let it sit there. But those two, I think, really, that complements each other as a way of working. And I hadn't thought, before reading this, I hadn't really thought about that, the productiveness of the disagreement. So it's like, now it's, it's jello, it's making more sense to me now. How are we doing? Yeah. Yes. I don't know if anyone ever feels this, but when you actually like sound like you're really clear about what you're doing, <laughs> and then you're kind of going and making your work, and it doesn't yeah. go out that way. <laughs> that's just. That's why. It's Is nice. that a warning? Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's so really difficult to have these big philosophies in yes. your, your work because then the audience, you never know what you think and how you can say it in your performances. And for uh, me, because I'm Finnish talking, and oh, I saw I, in Iceland, they really love this Icelandic language, Vikings language. So, and sometimes to speak of your performances and say these theoretical things are bad for me because my language is mathematical in English and Finnish other times. So uh, that's the point that I missed something what you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I may not, I may just break your gesture. No, 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 I thought I thought that you might say something, but I was I think it may be because you know, we're, we're discussing uh, collaboration, we're discussing all this, organizing, we're discussing all these kind of things. And I think, uh, I don't know, we, uh, uh, all these words, where I think the most important thing is that we make the work, we show the work, right? This is also why we're here, we're here to show you what we're doing for work. And what we're saying about this stuff is, is in the end, kind of, you know, it's interesting for say, uh, say. It. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> so you're doing, you know, so the work, so there's work in which the process is the key element of the work, but nevertheless, that's not what the audience sees, yeah. because they see the work, and if the work is not there, then what the hell do they see? Nothing. Yeah, why are we then talking? 
I don't think it's irrelevant. I think on some level, I mean, it's, it's something it's different. It's not the work. What we have to acknowledge is it's not the work. And it's still another level of understanding. Yes, of course, but I, th I just think that also, like, uh, I've been here for a long time now. Yes. And we've been discussing a lot, a lot, a lot, yes. a lot, a lot. And I feel a little bit like I'm uh, running out of words. <laughs> I've said everything, and we've discussed everything. And, and in the end, well, if I we discuss it too much, to if we discuss it too much, I'm afraid that it will will break something for ourselves. The because the, 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 there's magic in That's the also word. The you know? And there is no the magic words. in the language, in the discussions. Oh, I don't agree that there's no magic in the discussions. Okay. There's so, a lot of, I do agree, though, that you can get saturated. There's a limit. You know, you go to a museum, you go to another museum, you go to another looking at art, looking at art, and like, okay, okay, I've seen enough for one day or for one week. Like, you can get saturated. But <clears throat> there's a stimulation that happens when you're exchanging ideas. That's there. Of course, of course. And, and you actually just gave language a lot of power, if it could saturate or destroy or erode. Well, language is a virus and viruses are powerful. I have one other question that yeah. kind of takes us away from where we are now. I don't Good. Know. That's okay. You know, here in Toronto I've done a lot of organizing. But very little and the, and one of the main reasons, I mean for me organizing is research for, for what I do to find colleagues, but also when I started organizing, part of it was about to try and build an audience for the kind of work that I was doing that I felt no one here knew or appreciated, and this was a way of kind of uh, developing an audience, developing a sophistication, which I, which I think has happened very much, but the ironic thing I realize is actually I almost never perform in Toronto. In Toronto, I'm thought of as an organizer, yeah. and, and almost none of my work gets seen here. I've seen that happen with other disciplines also, people and, have taken up all on and so forth. I'm just curious with each of you, to what extent your practice is based in your community, and how much of it you do there, versus how much of it is actually performing. As, as an art, as, 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 as a performer, as a community. Yeah. And you mean a geographical community? Uh, partially, but not Entirely. In Norway, I teach and organize. And uh, for me, it's everywhere else. Uh -huh. Not in Norway. Hardly. You go first. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think that I do half and half. I, I really want to do performances also in Finland. Uh, yeah, yes. And because uh, I want to be a Finnish performance artist. Uh, something in Finland. Yeah. Uh, that's important for me because I become quite soon 60 and I want to have a retrospective, some kind of exhibition for sure. in, in my life. Or oh, something like that to be a uh, Finnish artist, really. And in Finland, the performance art is growing. I think that it is now on the top as a mount. And I think that, yes, we are in optimum and it's going down. So uh, they are so interesting now in Finland of performance. And we must have educated them, like you said. We must have an educated audience to do performances. And we are nearly east, and so performances growing up in Asia and everywhere in this Baltic country. Poland is good. Every eastern country is like nearly we finish. So I like to be there. I have been now in Russia two summers. I have been there and that's very interesting. Russia are Russia, yes, really. But interesting. They they um they have long history and culture. So uh, what you yes, that's my, my life. I really want to do also to be my I've just returned to Ireland so um, I haven't any really formative, previous forms of adult life there. So I, I'm reinventing myself there I can. But um, so they don't know me yet, is my, my point. And uh, probably since I was yeah, 17, if I was to average it out, I'd probably maybe move to city every year. So I don't have, I have this sort of like, in some cities, people know me as organizer, some live artist, some sound artist, sometimes as an academic. There's not 
Can I just another whole face. face. Can I try to be the moderator for a second? Can I what? Can I take your role for a second? Yes. <laughs> because you threw in this kind of building an audience kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? It means to us Labar. We especially Labar. Because uh, my son wanted the young people who has no money to go to Samus and to, to pay two euros, two euros. I can sell beer for them for two year, uh, euros, and so they put money for that. But yes, that is uh, because um, uh, we have connected in Lapa also sound. So we have had a lot of sound together with performances. So we have mixed, I have learned to to listen sound sound, chat and noise and everything. Next Lapa is only sound again. Yes. So this is educate. To get uh, people who never want to go to museo or art museo to do art, they can come to Lapa to, to see performances. But this is also a question about uh, what being in the street or or uh, going after the audience or trying to get the audience. Uh, streets are bad, uh, quite bad. Once I was in New York and uh, it was Shashama Theatre, it was this Dan McGergan who organized the festival. Nobody came in, there were tickets were something like some dollars, almost 20, 25, quite big money. There were perhaps uh, five persons in the audience, <laughs> so they have not educated in New York the audience to come to look performances. But, but because it was in Times Square, so you know how many people were just out. So there's American artists, mm, they did the performances outside, but we European people, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the Polish artist, uh, artist Eva Ripska and Vladislav Kaczmierczak, they were so angry, so angry. They, they came from Poland and they were, there was no audience. So these kind of things we try to, try to change. Uh, but there was a person who, who was talking, please come in, come in, like you said. Yes, you can go out to the street and try to get uh, people to come in to look performances. The result is zero. Yeah, but, but, but you didn't make In your individual work. In your individual work. Uh, in, uh, uh, in your individual work. In, in your individual work. And how I educate. Uh, how, how do you think? How do you think of your work as an instrument, or if you do, for building uh, audience? Uh, what is that about? How, how does that manifest what you do? It's, um, oh, I, it was like this that I, when I started to be optimist, so I started to uh, advertise myself, not anymore, but in that time I started to advertise myself as a, um, some kind of performance action. I'm star, I'm performance star. And uh, so I, I could uh, have some kind of uh, people to, to think what, you, what I mean. So perhaps I could have some story in Vimit's uh, magazine and so on. So they, they think that, before, that uh, I'm some new artist, like a big, big name. I met the first time when I had this performance artist named Ilma Optimist. Many people came to see, uh, to, to look at me and said to me, oh, you are that Ilma Optimist. The, the name was good and so on. Uh, and uh, because I was in, in university as a teacher, oh, different mathematician teacher, so they came to look me. And, uh, and I had no this, because I started just to, I knew what could be performance, but I did performances from my own head, so they were quite difficult, and always I have done performances with a very different audience. I'm the person who can uh, can collect people from many areas. They and if they can get to look me, they can go to another. So I have tried to be instrument for that to to the, how to explain my you want to build an audience for the practice as well as for yourself. Yeah. But I think uh, the question the question is a little different in terms of uh, 
what you do. Mm -hmm. I think one one can be attempting to build maybe profile is not the word, but if if you are advertising yourself is mm -hmm. one thing. But um, my question is regarding the nature of your work as an audience builder is a very different um, regard as an artist. And we want how to talk about the work work now. Yeah. We're talking about the work. It's about the work. What I do in my not in not not about how you how I, I call it access the, the work. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So my question is how do, how do you think individually as the three of you there as artists? Mm -hmm. How do you see your work? And how, how do you go about making that build of audience happen? How, how, what, what, what approaches do you take specifically? Like, can you say, for me, instead of using the word optimism, or just, that's, that's part of it, okay, as a word, as a name, but tell me, I don't know your work, and, I, and maybe tomorrow night, you perform tomorrow night. Yeah. I see this. But can you tell us, as, as someone that is a stranger, you know, that we don't know your work, um, how, it, how it takes that approach? What is that approach for you? How do you approach that idea to, build, to, to get... Because I think, in some ways, your dialogue with yourself as an artist is preference in your development in the, in the discipline. Do you agree or disagree? Do you think that when you make work, you, you are from a community that that is given? You know, whether you know what I do or what he does or she does, you are also connected in this uh, building. Despite an audience expectation, there's an expectation probably that we each have in regards to what we do. So how does that in some ways educate or build an audience. How do you go about with that conscientiously? Uh, through my work, yes. Yeah. Yes. So what I have uh, talked about now it's quite, uh, uh, what to say, not so deep discussion because uh, that was past what I have done and in Finland. And uh, now I'm really in the country where you have seen a lot of performance. I think that uh, tomorrow there will be nobody who has never before, no, anybody who has never seen performance before. So I think that you are educated in, in, in some kind of meaning. And what I want to say in my performances, I really want to say that the audience is clever, it is uh, cliche, but but uh, my background to try to say something is not so like before two points and say something like that, just, just to, like to teach or to have some kind of lesson of some the body of man or something like that. Mm -hmm. I say nothing. I just want to show different dimensions of because we are now in this three dimensional. Uh, room and uh, <coughs> uh, my my approach to do performance is mathematical because I'm working with that and I and uh, I must say that my head is full of this kind of thinking so I want to show how how these dimensions change uh, we have three dimension two dimension zero dimension. And I want to, uh, to say something in my way. I am sure that uh, the people, the audience, think these symbols, what I show, in their own way. So then I want to, I, that, uh, and I want that people think them in their own way, because they are not thinking like me, of course. And I think that that is some kind of education, that there is something to think. If you, if you do abstract performances, so they are so open for what you think of them. Before I did performance, I explain, I explain, I explain in, during the performance. So that's why I think that they were not so interesting. 
Now I try because I'm old, I try to <coughs> be more open that people can think by themselves. <laughs> yeah. I said something like that, difficult to speak in. Um, can I think the race, uh, Agnes would also like to public respond to Michael's question. Can you rephrase your question briefly, maybe? Yeah, well, it's kind of, there was Agnes's question with the audience, and then yeah. there was your specific question about within the work, how do you deal with the audience? Um, I'm going to quickly say, in relation to audience first with Agnes, I don't know how general, but sometimes I think of, um, I'm selfish with the audiences, like in the work that I was kind of curating or, 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 or producing, it was, um, I wanted that night, that type of work to exist in my place and it wasn't existing and therefore there's a bit more of a selfish reason, a personal reason behind it. Um, and then there's almost the pedagogical side of audience building where you, um, you, you've met some artists from that locality and you, you need to kind of construct a context to support the work there. And I think for me though, there are the two things on that level. But in relation to your question about the audience in the work, um, I started off making work where the audience were very much directly brought in to the piece. So, so they were um, yeah, part, part of the, the process of the work, the emergence of the work. Um, and that's become a bit less as I've gotten older. Um, and maybe a little bit more traditional in its presentation of kind of the, the viewer, the audience as a, as a, as a active viewer. Um, what drives that? Pardon? What drives that shift? Um, what drove that? Actually, when, the, when you asked us and Irma was talking, I was thinking about kind of protection. Perhaps a little bit because I had kind of created work where ah, this is a, I don't know if this was the shift, but I had created work where allowed, in some respect, the audience or people to come very much into your private space, and you can see uh, how 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 far people can sometimes push push things. You can see the ugly side of humanity. Right, for one, you know, you can, you can see how, how people, if they haven't got a barrier, can, can, or they have a barrier, an interface can really, you know, pull your hair if they want to get a chance to pull your hair, that kind of thing. Uh, and I don't know if I really wanted to, to be revealing that side of, of humanity within the work. So I kind of thought, okay, what kind of thing do I, what kind of, what kind of thing do I want to create here? I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic. About human yeah. conditions of this. Can I, can I ask something? Um, Peter's and Agnes's response actually to Michael's question and then. Thank you. There, there's something you, you met earlier on though in terms of this kind of um, came up in terms of the um, relationship between restriction and limitation. It's like one, one can be imposed, yeah. as you just described, perhaps. And uh, working within limitations, there are two different cycles of work. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, the other night, the night before, the panel was very much about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I think that was a theme that came up in the talk. And perhaps when you when you mentioned the word protection and limitations or imposed limitations, you made me feel that vulnerability was not a strength. Was that? It made me feel that the idea of being vulnerable in the world is not a strength. I got the impression <coughs> that if we impose, if you say, I do not wish to go there, you are imposing limitations for the world in some ways, and then you're in, you know, being in vulnerable is being controlled. And my question would then be, in some way, there is the evident question, what I'm trying to get at, is okay. our world probably is being driven in a way where there's expectations. Yeah, okay. 
but I, I, I guess I was thinking about specific types of work. I mean, I, you can mm. you can expose your vulnerability, your uncertainness, your 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 uncertainty in in, in different ways. And when you asked me about uh, the question about how does the audience come in, I was thinking about one one specific piece of work, which. Uh, and also then thinking about what I, what I, what kind of work I want, what kind of atmosphere, mood I wanted to create in work. What kind? Of, I guess it's about what kind of vulnerability you want to kind of expose. I can't answer this. I don't know what to say. Actually, I think it made me think about something I haven't thought about, and 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 I don't know what to say anymore. Oh, it's good. I like it. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that, like, what kind of vulnerability are we talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, performance art is an encounter, right? And it's, uh, it's a meeting between the audience and performer in real life. And this makes it, uh, and, and the potential of, uh, of a looseness or an unpredictability or no set rules about the, the contact between the audience and the it's very interesting to me. But that can take many, many different forms. Um, but I also am quite concerned with the respect for the audience, you know, uh, and to... I'm, I'm trying to talk about what's in my head, and, uh, and I don't expect to, everybody to understand that, but I'm hoping that it's communicating something at some level. And I can only sort of say something about how it looks like in here. And, uh, and that's what I'm interested in exploring. So I don't really work so directly with like how will the audience kind of communicate with me and that. Do you understand what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 um, uh, but sometimes I, I sometimes I include the audience in my performance, and sometimes I don't. But I always make a, a different performance for each place that I'm going to and try to integrate a little bit how is the audience situation here. You know how <coughs> who am I in this situation, right? So I'm quite conscious about who I am in the cultural co context when I'm travelling around the world doing performances as this Norwegian might go from a privileged country. But don't, don't you have to separate the indoors and the outdoors? I mean, that's, that's I mean, what you're doing. That's it. When you do something in the street that I prefer myself, you are much, much more vulnerable to the whole society's all actions and, and, and eyes and stuff like that. When you do something in white box, it's an audience who came there. It's no accidental audience that I think is so vulnerable to, to that you are exposing yourself for a, a, a how do you say, a unaddressed audience, an accidental audience. Yeah. I, so. but, you know, I, I think yeah. that, um, it was mentioned very early in this. Collaboration is difficult, and um, the difficulty of that made me feel that the strength that was uh, adverse to the singularity. You know, like if you act as a single, you know, if you act as a, an, a on your own, it's a different kind of responsibility. But similarly, with the group effort, there is also the individual responsibility. You know, it's like on that level you speak of the group, but you also see yourself as part of this group. So there's no real separation in the group at some point. You know what I mean? Like at some point there is this sense of uh, the other that makes for the possibility that something else occurs beyond the individual. That's why we work together. That's why we collaborate. You know, we, we wish to be undone or we wish to supersede, or we wish to be frazzled, or untangled, or dismissed, or however you look at it. We, we look at large, more in large, because we want to go beyond ourselves, simply get past. And sometimes we see ourselves individually as an obstacle to ourselves. And I, I think that um, your idea of the street, and the idea of in here, that's true that the audience here, the people here, are privileged on some level. And maybe we are talking to the, uh, the contemporary 
but I think uh, the interesting thing is if you hold this um, responsibility to yourself and to know the street in a certain way and to know uh, the studio or the gallery, somewhere in there maybe there's a belief, a belief system for my work that stretches. You know, it's about stretching something that has nothing to do with audience, has nothing to do with space versus uh, walls, but somewhere it's about the work that I'm interested in. And I think if, if you carry that, then maybe even in the gallery, the walls are disappearing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so how do we do that in our world? And that, that would be where my question is coming from. Um, I'd like to bring this back to Ed. Do you want to respond to Michael? Uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, when you hear when the workshop kids were from the work, workshop uh, last week. No, no last week. And there was uh, some poems in the window that really drew attention to the audience outside. And so people came in here that wouldn't naturally kind of feel this as their environment. And I thought this was quite an interesting thing in terms of audience that when we go out in the streets, we want to talk to everybody, right? We want to build an audience, like you're saying. But when, when people start coming in here, that we're not used to being there, you know, they don't belong to our group in a way. I thought it was quite an interesting question arising, like, are we, we are putting a sign outside saying free, come in everybody, but when they are actually coming in, we're starting to like shiver a little bit. Is this, is this what we want? You know, and are we maybe a little bit snobbish? You know? Do we want to talk to the audience in the street when we choose to? But do we want to always have them in here with us? There's also the contradictions of galleries such as this that in some ways take a populous storefront. You know, compare this gallery to say Mercer Union across the street. There, there's, a, there's a serious cut. You know, that there's a very different flavor. This engages in what, I mean, I try to never use the definite article of the word community, because I think it's problematic, but this engages with the neighborhood and the public in a very different way than a more formal art institution does. And there's traditions of work, there's, you know, that's a contradiction that the gallery itself works with, and that is part of their decision to be in a particular neighborhood or not that neighborhood. Um, I think we're going to have to start winding down, unfortunately. Chill, will you better go? Can we maybe have last comments from each of the panelists? I'm, I'm sorry, because I really like where Timothy is going, but I think we do have to start winding down. There's another day. Or two. Or three. Yeah, and these questions are not particular at particular time or location. Please come back. Um, we want to wind down by the final summation. Each of you. Thank you very much. It is big education, so so really I, I understood. If I try to organize this kind of seminar that people or meeting point, so it's impossible still in Finland. We uh, many many years after you because uh, every this theory books of, of performance art they are not finished. Only my husband did finish and uh, one doctoral dissertation just came in Finnish. So we are a lot of discussion, uh, but we follow, yes, thank you, I try to do this kind of things later in Finland. Thank you for giving me a microphone and a chance to get all this attention. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jeffrey's piece in the window actually brings a lot of people into the gallery who normally wouldn't come into a gallery and I'm all full of Anyways, that's my last word. Um, Paul, do you have some last words? Uh, no, just thanks all for coming. And, and your input. And thanks and especially project. to the panelists. <laughs> Irma Optimist, <laughs> Reza, Dylan, and Agnes. <laughs>